I just thought I was screaming. Okay. Um, the um, f- food collection for the CUOC for April is cornbread mix and pork and beans. Um, 2022 phone number and address update. Forms uh, to fill out are in the vestibule in the back there, and uh, the information will be for uh, a new church directory. We're going to go ahead and put something together ourselves, and that'll be nice. Easter sunrise service and breakfast uh, next Sunday, 6.15 a.m., and then the benediction in the cemetery, followed by breakfast in the fellowship hall. Um, uh, we have our Easter regular worship at 10.30 a.m. here in the sanctuaries. Regularly scheduled board meeting is Sunday, April the 24th, immediately following worship service. Um, that's an that's a announcement Sunday for appointments as well. The United Methodist Women, uh, Tuesday, May 3rd at 6 p.m. by Zoom. United, Meth- uh, United Methodist Youth Ministry, Saturday, May 21st at 5 p.m. before the movie. So we'll go ahead and... Uh, start to get that back together again, which is good news. Um, information on the movie night is right there for May 21st. And then uh, uh, all the information that you need for Vacation Bible School to share with your family and friends and neighbors, it's all listed there for both um, in-person and virtual online uh, uh, experience. And um, Vacation Bible School teachers and um, and handcrafts, that's right, we need... If you're involved in the VBS and you need um, some things for your station, make sure you go over the packet that you were given. Uh, We need to know uh, to order those things by May 1st to get them here on time. Um, I want to let, do you want to make the announcement? Yesterday was a beautiful day at the church. There was uh, how many? 30? 32. 32 children here families. Uh, it was a, a fabulous time. Um, thank you for uh, organizing that and all those who helped out. Um, thank you very much. Ha- had a great time. Uh, talked to, I, I had a great time. I talked to a, um, a family who came to Old Union 20 years ago, uh, moved away to New York, and then came back to Greensboro and has her grandson. And uh, she saw the announcement and she said, I have to come down and see and we had a great time. So it, we never, you never know how these kind of things work out, but there's a lot of connections, and, and uh, um, it, was, it was a good time. So thank you for that and all those who helped out. Yes. All right, good. Bill, would you uh, lead us in our psalm this morning? Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am distressed. My eyes waste away from grief, and my soul and body also. I am the scorn of all adversaries, a horror in my neighbors, an object of the dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. For I hear the whispering of many, terror all around, as they as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. Tommy and I also thank you for prayers for me and our family. Send a couple of us here to help everybody in need. Yeah. 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 Center page 513. Page 513.
Join with me as we recite the Apostles' Creed, and as we do, let these words guide us, advise us, and fill our hearts as we live out our lives as followers of Christ. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he should come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Grab one, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So, our first thing that we're going to do, uh, we've got a lot of participation in this one because we're going to be talking about uh, uh, today and it's a very special day. But, are there any birthdays that we need to celebrate this week or next coming in? All right. We're going to sing to Debbie. Anybody else? All right, let's go ahead and sing happy birthday. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Ron, okay, good. <laughs> Any anniversaries this uh, week or next? All right. So today we are talking about a very uh, a fun word that I like. It's called a parade. Have, how many of you guys know what a parade is? How many of you guys have gone to a parade? What kind of a parade have you gone to? It's a good answer. Veteran, yes, we have uh, veterans parades a lot. Yeah, sure. Christmas, Christmas parades. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We have parades a lot of time, and they're what they are is they are for us to celebrate something or honor something, and to say, hey, we want to come out and appreciate what's going on for what is. Whatever it might be, whether it's a Christmas parade, I was always involved as a park ranger in the holiday parade in uh, San Jose, and we'd always get together and put a float there, and it was a great time, and we would uh, 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 drive through town and, and have uh, uh, a good time that would kick off the Christmas season for the city. But there's a parade that we're going to learn about in Scripture today, and it is the time when Jesus came into the city. And you guys are all holding something in your hand, or some of you are. Palm fronds, that's right. Um, and when, at this time in Scripture, Jesus came in, and um, a tradition that they had for royalty, those people would be kings and queens, right, is that they would have a parade where they would put their coats down or they would put um, um, branches or palm fronds down so that the person that was walking would not... Uh, their feet would not touch the ground because it was a sign of respect. And then what would happen is that that person walked through, they would follow behind them and wa be waving and saying a very special word. It's called Hosanna. Can you all say that? Yeah. That's right. Good. So we're going to try a parade. How about that? You want to do a parade here? Yeah. All right. So we're going to, you guys are going to stand up, get your palm fronds. And you're going to imagine that uh, Jesus is walking in. I'm not going to pretend to be Jesus, but we can imagine him walking in. And then I will walk behind Jesus, and you guys can walk behind me. And then you got to be waving your palm fronds and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. All right? You guys ready? And then the crowd, which we're just going to say is the church, they're going to join in as well. All right? 
Could we get some marching music, maybe? No? All right. Ready, set, go. Come on, follow him behind me. Wave your, wave your palm. Right. And you're supposed to be saying, Hosanna. It's a joyous, happy time. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And we're going to go around here. Don't hit anybody with your palm fronds. Bye. Come on up. Hosanna, Hosanna. Ho this is the king returning. Everybody, come on. All right, good job. You guys can line back up and sit down. So we have all kinds of parades that we celebrate things, but today we are celebrating the um, uh, a very special ruler in our lives, a king, the Lord, and that is Jesus. And he came into the city, and the people that met him wanted to show how they felt about him. So they threw him a parade. And that's why we celebrate Palm Sunday, because this is the beginning of a very special week of Holy Week that leads up to next Sunday, which is Easter. That's right. So good. So whenever you have an opportunity to welcome somebody, you could always just throw them a parade in your house. As they come to the door, you can lead them in. You can grab some uh, palm fronds or whatever, but you can show them how much you appreciate what they are doing and what, who they are. And that's basically what took place today. All right. Good job. You guys are good paraders. All right. So let's see some prayer fingers. You can use your palms if you want to wave them. Ready, set, pray. Gracious God, we are grateful for the children in the church today, for parents who brought them. Uh, we're um, asking you to watch over them as they go about their day. Give them the protection and the strength they need in order to navigate their little lives. Um, and we also are grateful for the ability to see the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God through them as they are in our presence. And we do this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys can go. You can leave them there. You can take them with you. Into your classroom. Yeah. But we have to keep them here. There you go. There you go. That's what they're good for, too, as well. There you are. You're welcome. All right. As we go into a time of um, praises, and concerns. Um, again, I want to lift up yesterday the experience here at the church with uh, all the kids. That was a great praise and a good opportunity. Uh, any any um, concerns that we need to lift up this morning? Okay. Good. Uh, my brother, thankfully, uh, bless his family, drives one of the his truck's on a fire hydrant fleet. Mm. Drives one with him, and uh, somebody come up, beat on his door, and woke him up. And he was listening, and uh, they got out. And the truck was apparently uh, part of the ladder caught the truck caught on fire, and they were beating on the ladder and the truck got set on fire. Mm. Amen to that. That was, a, that was a good celebration. Good celebration. I love seeing those pictures. Any uh, others we need to lift up today? All right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, go to God in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we lift all of these requests to you. We know that you already know uh, what these individuals need in their lives and uh, and, and hopefully providing it to the point where they are able to see your presence. God, we do this because we are uh, interceding on their behalf, uh, just as Moses interceded on behalf of the Israelites before God. We are doing the same so that 
your healing and your protection and your peace can be known by all. God, we lift up this world today that we are in, um, a world that is um, shocked day in and day out from pictures and um, events related to war. Just, um, God, it's, it's hard to pray in those moments. It's hard to understand what people are going through, but we uh, are going to turn that over to you. We're going to offer that up to you and be a part of it in that way. God, we pray protection for all of those who are getting involved in this and moving around the world at this time. When that mechanism of war starts to move, there's a lot of uh, moving parts and things can happen. So we're praying protection for people who are in that process or uh, preparing in that process to leave their family and friends and homes and communities to go be a part of that. God, we lift up all of those who are in the um, places and the rooms that are making decisions about a uh, future of, uh, of uh, how this is going to go, give them guidance and what they need in order to make those decisions. We lift up all of those here in the United States who are uh, stepping out of their comfort zone in whatever way uh, to go ahead and uh, uh, make sure that our society works in the way that it does, allows us to live in the way that we can. God, we lift up all of those and ask protection over them. God, we lift up all the prayers that we have voiced today for those here in the church, those that we're hanging on ourselves and our, um, deep down inside of us that we don't feel are worthy of lifting up to you or voicing to you. But we do that now. We lift those up. We know that you hear them. We give those over to you for your work, your action of the Holy Spirit to be a part of that process to be a part of that situation, whatever it is. We invite the Holy Spirit in at this moment. God, we do this with the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of those trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, you can take Sheila Walker off. Okay. Our scripture for today, uh, we are in the gospel of uh, Mark. Uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Hear these words. When they were approaching Jerusalem and Bethaga and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the ground, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut off in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. So we kind of have to wonder what's going on here, and we've got some pictures I hope will come up. Yeah, there we go. Kind of take a look at these as we go through them, and they're depictions of... This verse uh, that is 
reported in all of the Gospels. And um, what's going oh, Hang on a second. I'm, I, get, I got locked out. There we are. Um, we're dealing with a Lenten journey um, that we're about to end today. Um, Lent is behind us, and we have talked about what that looks like, and uh, hopefully we've had an opportunity to um, participate in some spiritual practices and develop something new and done something different in order to help us uh, be a part of what uh, God is doing in our lives and be open to that. And on this day, we're invited into another journey that leads through death to resurrection and rebirth and on Easter morning. Um, today, we uh, uh, have read uh, a piece of scripture that we uh, um, ha find Jesus at the gates of the city. And on the screen, we're seeing different depictions uh, of painters and artists throughout the years who have kind of tried to capture what took place that morning. Because it's a strange piece of scripture. It's like, why has it been, putting, why has it been put here? Why uh, are we reading it? Um, and uh, what's going on here in this moment? And some people have said that a picture is worth a thousand words. But it's an interesting reflection this morning as we look at how we're going to go forward uh, uh, into Holy Week and how we have concluded Lent. Um, this piece of scripture, we, there's no ways about it. We have to talk about Jesus interacting with his culture at his time where he was. Um, it's just there. There's so much of it that talk about his, uh, the place where he was preaching into. And um, in all of this, we have a twin narrative that's taking place here that Jesus is uh, reflecting on. There's more than one thing that's going on, and there's a lot of moving parts as we look at what is taking place. First, we have twin traditions within the church itself. Some churches celebrate this as Palm Sunday, the triumphant uh, entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, the end, uh, the marking of his um, ministry in the public, and others uh, within the church tradition over the years have used this as a Passion Sunday, or the start of Holy Week, the beginning of the end uh, for Jesus. And however we celebrate it and whatever we do, as long as we are being faithful to what Jesus uh, was doing here, I think that is the important thing. A good Holy Week um, reflection as we go into it uh, is to read the Gospel of Mark. I, I've read that um, and I like Mark because he breaks down Jesus' journey in the Holy Week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Even Friday is broken down into three-hour blocks from 6 a.m. to 9, the same uh, time that uh, Roman uh, authorities would have kept their daily calendar by. So we know what Jesus is going on, what's going on in Jesus' ministry and his life in the Holy Week if we just focus on Mark. Um, there's going to be some services on Thursday and Friday at some of our uh, missional connection churches, and I'll get that information out for you during the during the day at noon. Um, but it is a time to reflect. What are we What are we doing here in this Holy Week? How are we conducting ourselves? So that's the first thing that kind of takes place. There's um, two twin demonstrations that are taking place here, and I touched on this last week when we talked about how uh, Passover and Jerusalem and the city. Uh, that there would be this procession coming in the front gate of the city, and in the back gate there would be a Roman procession coming in of uh, support troops that were going to um, um, help the, the garrison that was already there because Passover was always a good time for revolt within um, Jerusalem. Uh, there's a long history of uh, the zealots that would come out during this time, and um, they're a Jewish uh, sect that... Uh, under their robes, they would have knives, and they would go out in the crowds, and they would stab Romans or others. Um, and that's actually where we get our word assassin from uh, as um, uh, today. So th there's a lot of stuff going on there that, that, uh, um, that we can look at. But in this case, uh, Jesus, uh, from his point of view, he was looking at it as the Roman control of the city of David, as we uh, saw here today, our ancestor David. 
but also the, the Roman control of the temple, um, the temple that was built by David's son, Solomon, and, and the conflict of what is going on there between how that city and how that temple, how that house of God is being used today with respect to what Jesus was doing in his ministry. And he focused on Zion. Um, and there's a lot of references to that in Proverbs 11:26, Isaiah 28:16, And it's a contradiction between what Zion was to be and what Rome had turned it into. So it's, it's clear and it's plain, it's in Scripture, so we kind of have to talk about it. It's uh, what Jesus is promoting as the gospel of, uh, uh, of God versus the Roman imperial theology of religion, war, victory, and peace through that process. So those two things are taking place in all of those pictures. Secondly, or thirdly, there's the, the twin kingships that are being referenced in these pictures. Is it Christ or is it Caesar Augustus, you know, the emperor? And at this time, it was Tiberius, who was really not a bad emperor compared to all the other emperors. He balanced the budget. He didn't really get in people's business as long as they kept the peace. But the words divine, son of God, Lord, redeemer, uh, uh, liberator, um, all of those, uh, uh, savior, were all um, used for both Jesus as well as the emperor. So there is a clear distinction between who is the son of God, who is um, uh, the true king, and the king kingship statements that Jesus is making here, and we know that he's making it deliberately because if we, when we listen to the scripture, he's already had this plan set up. It's not like it was a, um, a, a magical moment or a mystical moment or a Holy Spirit moment where Jesus tells his disciples to go in and talk to these people. He knew who was there and what they had, and um, the, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion around this um, demonstration that he's planning. But it's clear what he's saying here, both in uh, 2 Kings 9.13 and uh, 1 Maccabees 13.51, uh, where how a king enters a building and what they do. And this is all echoed in how we see the events of Palm Sunday. And specifically, and the most important one is the reference to Zechariah 9.9, which is the colt or the unwritten donkey. It is a clear um, a statement that he's making that I am a king of peace versus a king of war. Peace through love and salvation and sacrifice versus peace through victory, which is Pax Romana, which is the Roman way of doing things. Those two things were taking place in this one thing. And then we have the twin understandings of what Jesus was doing and his mission and what God had asked him to do. We have the Christ event versus salvation of the gospel and the transformation of the world through making disciples. Both uh, in the second temple hope to restore Israel, there was always this idea of the Messiah, the one that was going to come in. He was going to restore the people of Israel. He was going to restore creation, and there was going to be everlasting peace. There had been messiahs that came before Jesus that they thought they, he was the one, and there were some even after in history that we can look at that caused different discussions and, and you know, ideas about who and what the messiah is. Even Peter, in last week's uh, reading, we, we hear him, uh, or in, in Lenten reading, we hear him kind of reflecting this idea of this Christ event of he was going to be the one and he was rebuked by Jesus saying, get behind me, Satan. You have your uh, thoughts on things of man and not of heaven. The Messiah, we don't really know how the Messiah was supposed to wipe out the Roman Empire and restore Israel. We don't know if it was supposed to be a progressive thing or if it was going to be a magical thing or if it was going to be just a, you know, an event that took place. But even those who um, uh, we see in Scripture, after the fact, the two that were walking away on the road, uh, they were disheveled and they were upset that, you know, they killed the Messiah. How could they kill the Messiah? Um, and so we know that there is these uh, echoes in, in Scripture that tell us that there, there was some, they were expecting some kind of thing to happen. It was going to be magical. It was all going to be taken care of. Um, and what we see here is 
um, what Jesus showed them uh, and what happened in the Holy Week. Clearly, it didn't happen that way, right? What we are uh, told in Scripture is that we were called to, to follow, to start um, uh, with what we talked about in John and uh, last week about how we live our lives with the mind of Christ, as Paul talks about it, to be obedient as Christ was, even obedient to death, death on a cross. And this, um, this event that Jesus uh, um, was a part of and willingly participated in uh, was focused on our sin and the sin of the world. And the only thing that can resolve sin in the world is death and death on a cross. And salvation uh, that we have in this process allows us to participate with Christ, to participate with God and what Christ and God we're doing in our world today. That's the difference between those two events. One is, it's all going to be taken care of for us. We don't have to worry about it. And the other one is, no, we need to get involved. We need to do something. Jesus was focused on Rome that day because that was the... Um, the powers and the principalities that he was dealing with. And when we look at the powers and the principalities, it's basically just the demonic activity that moves us away from God's uh, grace and God's gospel and whatever fashion it might be. And all throughout history, we see this uh, distinction of powers and principalities. Even today, there's a dramatic um, um, example of it uh, with Russia's sacred nation status um, with respect to the war in Ukraine. Uh, I read a fascinating article. Um, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church would start in the capital of Ukraine, and that underlying all of this stuff, too, in addition to oil fields and grain and national uh, status, there's a desire to capture the city that founded their church. And we see that all throughout history with the Crusades and all other, going back to capture Jerusalem, it's this sacred nation thought of that we are uh, anointed by God as the nation that is supposed to restore things. And that's a dangerous place to be. The United States has been a part of that. We've kind of um, uh, flirted with that a little bit. But we're not as um, um, bad as most situations where all the actions, all of what we do is... Um, thought to be condoned by God because we have this sacred nation status. But we can look all through history and just see what that looks like. So all of that stuff is taking place in this one little piece of scripture. All of that stuff is being said in those pictures that we see. It's a huge implication of this one little piece of scripture, this one narrative that we find in this time of Lent. But it's a focus on what the powers and the principalities are for us today and how we look at that and how we are working as the body of Christ to go into that. And are we even willing to do that? Are we willing to confront those things? I always remember uh, both in the police academy and in the fire academy specifically, uh, when we would go through the first day, we would sit down, everybody would be excited, and the uh, battalion chief would walk in, and he'd basically say, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get tired, you're going to be dehydrated. You're gonna, uh, all the most horrible things that you can uh, possibly imagine, and you might even die, and you, you know, it's a, a very low salary, and you're not going to get the recognition as a city firefighter because you're a wildland firefighter. And if you still want to go ahead and do it, go ahead and stay, and if not, go ahead and leave at this point. It's kind of the same thing here. As followers of Christ, we have to figure out, are we willing to go ahead and move forward with what the gospel is asking us to do and take Jesus' example of confronting those powers and principalities within our world today? And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be, I'm not talking about national government. I'm talking about anything that pulls us away from the gospel in a way that we confront them and look at how we live our lives. And something that is not mentioned in uh, the scripture, well, at the very end it is, but in these pictures too, is that Jesus did something that gives us some hope and gives us some courage. During this time and in the time that we uh, may need it as well, he returned each night to Bethany. 
Now, Bethany was a small little city, about 3K, about a mile and a half away from the, from the, uh, um, you know, from the city itself. This picture is a good one where he's kind of up on a hill looking at it. And um, it's the home of Mary and Martha, one of Jesus' only homes that he, we see in Scripture that he feels comfortable in to have meals and, um, and, and uh, knows who they are, and that's his place. We all have those you know, homes where we're welcomed, where we can take off our shoes and look in the refrigerator if we want and not have to ask to get a glass of water. That kind of home that Jesus experienced with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It was a safe place for him. It was a safe place for his followers. They used that place all during Holy Week. He's going and coming and going and coming from this place all throughout Holy Week. They can rest there. They can pray there. They can talk there. They can regroup there. That's where they plan the Last Supper and Passover. And it's away from those powers and principalities that have an effect on them and their thought. And it was such a secluded and safe place. Even when they came to arrest Jesus, they did it by night because, you know, they, they knew they couldn't go in there during the day. Nor could they arrest Jesus in the city because it would cause a riot. So he had these safe places to go to, to regroup and to focus on what he's doing and what God is asking him to do. And on this, you know, Palm Sunday, as we are anticipating the return and the hope of uh, Christ's return in our lives, we're living in that now, but not yet. We know that what he has done for us on the cross has allowed us to be free, to practice, to follow, to engage with the world that we live in. And on Holy Week, that is the start and end and the foundation of each day that he goes through where he is, you know, uh, going in and causing trouble in the temple on Monday and on Tuesday he's teaching and on Wednesday he's planning. Obviously Thursday is the Last Supper and then, um, you know, the, the whole trial that he goes through on Friday and the, and the crucifixion. How are we going to take care of ourselves as we go along this same journey? How have we built into our lives places that we call Bethany that we know we can go and rest and restore our souls and be a part of what God is doing in our lives? God gave us that gift through his son and through his son's act on the cross. But we're not supposed to be passively waiting for Christ's return. We're supposed to be working towards it as we anticipate it. And this is what Paul's gospel is to all his churches, and that's what he focuses on. What are you, what are you doing while you're waiting? Not supposed to be just passively waiting. So how are we going to spend our week, and where are we going to find our Bethany in our lives and in our communities that allow us to be rejuvenated, to be filled with Christ's spirit and with what God has asked us to do? God asks us to participate in with Christ's gospel. And I hope and I pray that on this Palm Sunday that we can either view it as an end of our Lenten uh, season and the beginning of something new. And as we go into the Holy Week, that we really restore ourselves on a daily basis. Start our day and end our day in something. Whether it is reading of scripture, of silent prayer, of music, of fellowship, whatever it is. Take this opportunity this week to build that into your daily lives, starting and ending in Christ and in the gospel. Because if you do that, I promise you that your day will be different. I promise you it will. I don't know if it's going to be good or it's going to be bad, but I promise you it will be different. It will be restoring it will be challenging. But it's something that we are asked to do. And this little story of Palm Sunday, and as we see the entrance in the parade, it allows us to figure out how we are going to be a part of that crowd. How are we going to wave our palms or lay our coats down as the Messiah comes into our world, 
and into our lives. And that is what I hope and pray for this Holy Week. Let us pray. God, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet and gather together. We are grateful for Scripture that gives us clear, clear understanding of your mission, your ministry, and the gospel, both when you were initially creating it and preaching it, and these 2,000 years later as we read it and reflect upon it both in words and in pictures and try to make that part of who we are and what we do as followers of Christ. Give us the strength and the courage to make that walk into the city gates, to leave our safe spaces of Bethany and confront the powers and the principalities of this world that are against what you and your mission is for us. We do this in Jesus' name. Amen. benediction let us leave here today let us leave here today with the knowledge that we too can participate in this parade this palm sunday parade give us the strength and the courage to find that bethany that restores us that cares for us so that we too can be a part of the kingdom of god here go in peace to love and serve the lord